welcome in this afternoon, viewers. We are happy to be back again to bring you some content through our balanced episodes. And today we are going to do part one of a two part series and giving some attention to the month of June, which is PTSD Awareness Month. And so we're very grateful to be able to have some content that's been put together by the Veterans Administration. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, I want to introduce our counselor who's going to talk through this because she's the one with all the knowledge and the experience of working with this. So I want to introduce Lori Coates to you. Thanks, Lori, for being with us. You're welcome, John. Glad to be here. Just by way of introductory kind of things, you've been with Samaritan two, three? Two and a half years. Yeah. And so this type of therapy work with clients along with PTSD, trauma, response. It's not just been two and a half years you've been doing it. No, I've been working um, with trauma for better than 20 years. So a lot of clients. A lot of clients. Yeah. So we want to give attention to that because this is important information. And even though we may think we've heard enough about it, we meaning the community, about, oh, I know what PTSD, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I thought I did till I started reading some of this, like, no, I don't. So that's why we want to bring this uh, content to you today. And again, we're going to do two parts of this. So today will be part one. And then next Wednesday, uh, we'll do part two of that. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here so we can uh, go through the PowerPoint that the Veterans Administration put together. It's from the National Center for PTSD. And you see on this first slide that this content is going to provide an overview and treatment and resource information for us. So the first half today, we're going to answer three questions. And those are highlighted on this slide. We're going to talk about what is traumatic stress, then how common are trauma and PTSD, and then what are the symptoms of that? And then we'll, we'll pause there and we'll pick up for next week, the second part of it. So looking first at what is traumatic stress, we have, they've included different examples of it that are interesting to compare to each other, right? Absolutely. Um, things like a car breaking down or not being able to pay your bills can be just as traumatic on people as something, you know, as war or, you know, it just depends on how, you know, they can process through what's happening. Yeah. To compare a daily hassle to a serious traumatic event, you see those examples over there. I thought it was sort of funny that uh, a traumatic stress is getting married. Oh, wait, getting married absolutely can be a traumatic stress. <laughs> I don't know that it has to lead to PTSD. No, not right? necessarily. I mean, not all traumatic stresses will lead to PTSD, right. but... Um, but they are nonetheless, it's traumatic mm -hmm. and it's traumatic for the person who's going through it. Right. And that's what is so important mm -hmm. is that we recognize that it's traumatic to the person at mm -hmm. that point in time. And one of the things I noticed on that slide that they didn't list that can also cause a traumatic stress is is the loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. Say a sure. parent losing a child or mm -hmm. even a, a daughter or a son losing a parent. Those can all be traumatic stresses depending on, again, how that that is processed through. Definitely. So when we talk about PTSD, we're mostly looking at this over yes. here typically. Yes, typically that's where you get your PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen cases where there's been like multiple deaths within a family mm -hmm. um, and because the person is actually been taking care of the person who passed away, it can actually mm -hmm. cause something PTSD as yeah. well. Sure. So those are some comparisons, viewers, of the, I, I tended to always think PTSD was just a, a war exposure and it's so much broader than that. So much broader than that. Right. Um, first responders, we see a lot of PTSD with first responders, police officers, and even like, and this is something that a lot of people don't, don't realize is your 
uh, correctional officers inside of the jail, a lot of them will take will come at, with PTSD. Hmm. Wow. So it's very broad. It's very broad. Yeah. So that gives an idea of the answer of what traumatic stress is. And now uh, next thought is, well, how common is it? Well, obviously, even from what we've already said, it's quite common. It is very common. A lot more common than most folks mm -hmm. believe. This slide gives us an example of at least 60% mm -hmm. of men, 50% of women. Right. As we go through more statistics, it's interesting to watch that play out, though. Yes. Because it's not strictly just that percentage all the time. Right. And I get a lot of questions. Why is it higher for men than women? Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why is because men tend to stuff their emotions. So when they feel stress or they feel or a traumatic event happens to them, they'll tend to stuff it down and not mm -hmm. want to talk about it. Right. Um, where women, uh, most women are more open to talking about their feelings and being able to get it out. So mm -hmm. I think that's why we have, but that's still a high ratio between yeah. the two. It's only a 10% difference. Yeah. So we all probably, uh, see if you agree with this, it's probably fair to say we all at some point have some sense of trauma. Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. We'll talk through, you know, when do you pass into a PTSD chronic right. stage? Um, but we've all been there. <clears throat> and this is another illustration of that. How common is it? So, I, well, what I was just saying, now we're getting into how common is PTSD, not just trauma. Right. So according to this, 7% develop PTSD in their lifetime, which right. still, that sounds pretty significant. Still pretty high. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I would, I mean, you know, uh, these statistics work back from 1995 when there mm. was not a lot, uh, mm. still not a lot known about PTSD and about trauma. So I would, I would probably guess that that number is even higher today. And I don't know, my brain's going toward COVID and the pandemic. I think we're going to see a lot more PTSD coming out of COVID. So this is a, a good time to be talking about this. Absolutely. Have awareness about that. So that's how common it is. Now we want to talk about the sort of criteria around what a traumatic event is. We briefly touched on that in that earlier slide. So walk through this with us, these four points about what a traumatic event is. Okay, so directly experiencing a traumatic event, that means you were a party to it. Okay. Um, we'll use being sexually assaulted as a child, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. You were the one actually being assaulted. Okay. So that's, you were actually a part of what was going on for the traumatic event. That's direct. Mm -hmm. um, witnessing in person means that you were there. Say someone got shot you were actually there seeing them get shot. Um, so you were a witness to that. Mm -hmm. um, learning about an experience of violence um, would be someone telling it. Mm -hmm. so it might have happened to a friend and you learned about it later. So mm -hmm. you weren't directly there when it happened, um, but it, has a, it does affect you. Sure. Um, and I see really a lot of that time kind of trauma mm. is where people have learned of an experience, mm. um, a friend getting shot, a, a, a loved one getting, you know, killed in a car accident. You know, they learned of the experience, but they weren't there. Mm -hmm. um, and then experience and repeated or extreme exposure, that would come more in like war. Mm -hmm. Um, it's something that's being repeated day after day mm -hmm. after day, mm -hmm. or, uh, say someone being systematically abused, mm -hmm. say sexually mm -hmm. abused, mm -hmm. it'd be something that you, it's happening to you over and over and over mm -hmm. again. And I could see potentially where certain professions that would apply to as well, oh, like absolutely. first responders, first responders, um, and, and and when we talk about COVID, you mm -hmm. know, nurses in mm -hmm. the hospital, yeah. 
you know, caring for those who have COVID who pass away and they have, you know, death after death after death, you know, uh, happening to, you know, they are being, you know, it, they're actually being exposed to that. So that, you know, again, is something that happens over and over and over yeah. again. Yeah. And that's why I think we're going to see a lot more PTSD um, post COVID mm -hmm. because of that. Yeah. <laughs> a lot to think about. It is there. a lot to think about. And again, that's why we're having this conversation to help us be aware that there it's it's pretty broad and deep. Mm -hmm. And now we want to look at some symptoms uh, that in the slide presentation, they put them in clusters. So we're going to look at four different things. And the idea here is to look at how many symptoms in these four quadrants. So the first one up in the upper left corner says at least uh, you're looking for, do you have at least one intrusion symptom? And across from that, at least one avoidance system uh, symptom. And then at the bottom, we'll look at negative alterations in cognitions and mood and then arousal and reactivity symptoms. So first of all, on the next slide, the intrusion symptoms, uh, flashbacks, again, that makes you think of war veterans, but that's not just exclusive to them. Right? No, it's not. Um, people, again, um, going back to say someone who's lost many loved ones or mm. several loved ones within a short period of time and say, I'll give you an example. You have a man who lost his father, lost his wife, all within a six month period. Um, but he was taking care of his wife who had cancer and died from cancer. Mm -hmm. He could have flashbacks because of, you know, seeing her, hearing her voice, things like that. That would be flashbacks where he would maybe dream at night of her, mm -hmm. dream of taking care of her, dream of things that he saw while she was dying. Um, you know, watching a loved one, most especially a spouse, you know, go through the death process is really hard, um, especially when you're the caretaker. Yeah. So that could cause an intrusive thought or mm. the flashbacks. Mm -hmm. so it, it's just the reoccurring nightmare or the reoccurring thought of this person mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the trauma that was attached to that. And I've read, I don't think it's in this PowerPoint, uh, but as far as triggers, there are things, sight, smell, smell, different Anything things. of your, any one of your five senses can trigger a flashback. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Could happen at any point. You don't at know when it's point, coming. No, you don't. Yeah. And that's why it's so hard to prepare people who suffer from PTSD. So what we do in the, in the clinical field is we, instead of trying to prepare them as we help them recognize what they are mm -hmm. and then how to cope with them when they happen because mm -hmm. we can't stop them from happening right. happening so we just can prepare the client for when it does happen how to handle it yeah how to process through mm -hmm. it so that's one symptom that we can look for uh, the second one is avoidance avoiding different you know, memories thoughts feelings and men do this quite well don't we Yes. Yes. Yes, you do. We get degrees in it, you would think. Like it should hang on the wall. Right. I have a degree in avoidance. <laughs> um, because men are typically stuffers, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot easier to avoid. But I've seen it with veterans as well, uh, war veterans who where, you know, they won't talk about the war at all. They won't watch war movies. They won't, you know, they're, they just won't engage in any activity that would remind them of that yeah. and that is what avoidance is is mm -hmm. not engaging in the activity that would cause a flashback mm -hmm. or would cause a memory so they um you know they'll just like totally you know block it out of their mind right or try to block it out of their mm -hmm. mind yeah that really doesn't work right because <laughs> your mind and there's another uh, slide we don't have in this presentation, but your mind stores these things. Absolutely. We have, we have, there are two parts of our, our mind. Mm -hmm. One is the, the conscious part of our mind that we use to do everyday things with, like we're using our conscious mind right now. 
Um, but then we have our subconscious mind. And our subconscious mind is like a hard drive on a computer. It stores everything that we've done from birth to present and beyond. Um, so when things are stored in the conscious mind, it stays there. It never goes away. Or the subconscious mind, sorry. Um, and then when we start having things like the flashbacks and the nightmares and things like that, that is the subconscious mind way of pulling it to the conscious mind so that we can deal with it yeah. and that's what it's wanting us to do yeah. is deal with it yeah when we don't deal with it then um you know that's when we get into trouble mm -hmm. this is good so these are two <clears throat> symptoms now the next two um this couple of slides ago said you may be looking for two of these types so first it's negative alterations in mood and cognitions so Help us understand that a little bit. Well, things like diminishing, diminished um, act, uh, interest in activities. It's mm -hmm. like things that you would have activities you would have done post PTSD, you now have no interest in doing. Mm -hmm. um, so you might have rode your bike, you know, a couple of miles a day where now you won't even get on a bike. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's, it's just stop you're stop you stop doing the things that mm -hmm. brought you pleasure before mm -hmm. in the little notes underneath that inability to feel positive emotions negative emotions so <clears throat> these are things we can be looking for in our loved ones absolutely right, right. so if you see someone who um, you know has gone through a traumatic event and you know you start seeing them you know, not doing things that they did prior to the event, or, you know, they start to feel detached, like they're pulling away, um, and, and these other things, mm -hmm. um, you know, their, their belief system is mm -hmm. now becomes negative. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, uh, say they believed in God before, and now, you know, they're saying, they start saying things like, well, there is no God, mm -hmm. you know, um, things like that. Right. So their belief system, mm -hmm. uh, when you start seeing them uh, turn negative to mm -hmm. that, then okay. those are the kinds of kinds of pictures that we see mm -hmm. that tells us that something deeper is going on. Okay. And then finally, arousal and reactivity symptoms. This seems to be one of the ones we we hear a lot about. Anger is one of the first things that when I see someone who is experiencing anger outburst or you see someone maybe say you have a loved one who has experienced traumatic event and all of a sudden they become very angry uh, at the and it can be the least little thing mm -hmm. um, you know you get somebody who you're riding down the road with them and somebody cuts them off and all of a sudden they're ready to chase them down and pound them to death you know i mean it, it's that sounds ex extensive but it's really not right. um right. i know a young man right now who is actually sitting in jail mm -hmm. because he suffered from ptsd and he somebody cut him off in traffic and he chased him down and shot him mm -hmm. Um, so those things really happen. Sleep disturbance is the biggest one too. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, will not be able to not be able to sleep. They're actually it's not that they can't sleep. They're afraid to sleep. They're mm -hmm. afraid to go to sleep right. because they're afraid of what's going to happen when they do go to sleep. Yeah. So they have a fear of actually going to sleep. Mm -hmm. So they don't sleep. Um, you know. So those are some of the things. Hypervigilance is another one. Um, hypervigilance is when you're constantly looking, you're constantly mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. watching around you. Um, and I mean, to the extent that it becomes unnormal or yeah. not normal. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah, so those are kinds of things. Concentration is affected. Um, you know, people start having problems concentrating sometimes on the least little thing mm -hmm. you no know, or they'll repeat something that they told you because they they can't remember that they said that yeah. so yeah 
Well, this is really helpful to us to know what, what we can be looking for that is going beyond just normal trauma. Right. And it's, it's chronic and it's yes. not going away. So <clears throat> uh, to repeat, most people do not develop PTSD right. following trauma. So this slide gives a, a comparison of lifetime PTSD versus current PTSD. I find this quite interesting back to the percentage about men and women, because when you look at this, it looks different from yes. that. What, what is this slide telling us? Okay, so lifetime PTSD is, it's something you're going to endure the rest of your life. It's, it's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. All you can do is manage it. Mm -hmm. um, it's like having chronic depression or uh, generalized anxiety disorder, or what we used to call finally like, uh, anxiety is where it's, it, it's something that you're going to have the rest of your life. It's okay. something you're going to have to deal with. It's like having diabetes, something wow. you're going to have the rest of your life. Okay. So it's something you have to deal with. Now on this slide, um, men have less lifetime PTSD as opposed to women. Women have usually longer lifetime PTSD. Hmm. Um, Why do you think that is? I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I, I would say that because women, I think, I believe women are more emotional yeah. is, is probably a contributor to it yeah. uh, because they are more emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and then overall, you can see that both uh, men and women overall comes up to sure. you know, eight, almost 8%. So what this tells us is <clears throat> even if you do have PTSD right now, it doesn't mean it's lifetime. <clears throat> Correct. So it's treatable. It's true. Well, PT Regardless, even lifetime right. yes. is treatable. Um, current PTSD means that, you know, you, you process through what happened and you can move on to what we call back to your normal. Right. Um, Lifetime PTSD means that they create a new normal. They don't get back up to where they were at before the trauma, but they can create a new normal for them. And well, that you know, positive. just be able to manage the symptoms yeah. where current PTSD means that the symptoms will go away altogether. Okay. And I'm sure, I'm sure we'll talk more about this in, in part two <laughs> of all right, managing, because uh, that, that can sound like, wow, a lifetime of this, um, if if you're told that, but it's not a death sentence. No, absolutely not. Just again, I relate it to a medical illness, say like diabetes. You know, doc, you go to the doctor, doctor says you have diabetes. Well, diabetes is not, you're not going to just take a pill and it's going away. Right. You know, it's a lifetime of managing your lifestyle so that you can manage the diabetes. Mm -hmm. But if you stop doing that, yes. the diabetes is going to rear its ugly head again. Yeah. Okay. So you can manage it, but not get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, lifetime PTSD is like that. You can manage it, but it's never going to be gone. If you stop doing the things that you're doing, mm -hmm. um, you're going to see the symptoms come back. So is it fair to say that the sooner you get into treatment, uh, the potential for it not being lifetime is decreased. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, I can't say that across the board. I can't say it across right. the board, but generally speaking, yes. The sooner you get into treatment and um, treat the PTSD after the trauma, the, the less likely it will be that it'll be a lifetime. And I would imagine our final slide here for our uh, first talk here is regarding a <coughs> uh, consequence of war. And one would think, and I, we probably all think this, that as far as a lifetime PTSD, these, um, those who have served um, may be more in that lane of, because the veterans have been exposed to so much. Right. And the more you are exposed to trauma, the more likely is who it is is that you will have lifetime PTSD. Yeah. And that goes back to the one of the previous slides where mm -hmm. you're talking about um, where you're talking about you know the the seeing it over and over and mm -hmm. over again. Right. Um, so the more trauma you experience, um, the 
the more likelihood that it'll be mm -hmm. a lifetime. Yeah. An interesting note on this slide, it says 15% of returning <coughs> post 9-11 veterans have PTSD. That's twice the number from that earlier slide. Yes. Which was seven out of 100. Right. So just a reality there, you can see different examples of mental health problems, not just PTSD. And we'll get into this in part two about uh, it just doesn't come by itself. There's other things no, that come along with it. No, there's other things that comes along with it. Right. Uh, depression, anxiety, um, the anger, you know, those are all things that we see out of PTSD clients. Well, viewers, <laughs> I hope you found this helpful. We hope that this is a giving you more than what you may have known before you came on uh, to view this today. So we're gonna end here for part one. And again, I wanna thank Lori for giving us her knowledge and experience here and uh, invite you to be back for part two next week as we continue answering these questions and creating our awareness for this so that we can see this in those around us uh, and also maybe even be paying attention, may even be bringing up stuff in our own lives that we didn't realize we men we've suppressed and it may be time for us to seek out some help if this is ringing true for someone that you know uh, we encourage you to reach out to us our number is 941-926-2959 you can also look us up at samaritangulfcoast.com to get more information about our services and our wonderful counselors like Lori. so thanks for tuning in today we're going to sign off for now and we'll be back next week for part two have a great afternoon.